Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Also meine Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this open forum. I would like to greet and welcome our guests, our panelists, whom I will introduce in a minute. As you know, every year, in parallel to the World Economic Forum, we organize the Open Forum in Davos, and it's the eighth time this year. We invite panelists from the economy, from all walks of life, from NGOs, from the church community. And this uh, forum, Open Forum, is co-organized by the Swiss Federation of Protestant Churches and the World Economic Forum. This afternoon's session is Climate Change Financing Urgent Adaptation. There's one thing that's quite clear, clear, and that is those countries that have done least to precipitate the climate change often are faced with the greatest climatic consequences. For example, in the Pacific Islands, on the Solomon Islands, for example, the World summits on climate in Copenhagen really failed or quasi-failed. No real agreement was found. No proper solutions were adopted to counter climate change. The developing countries need billions in order to fight against climate change, and they really require financial support. So who is supposed to pay? How much? and through what kind of international coordination. These are the topics that we will debate up here first on the podium between the panelists for about 45 minutes, and then you as participants will have the floor to put questions. I will be moderating in English and in German, and as I'm sure you can hear, my mother tongue is French. But there is no French here today, or at least no translation from French. Our panelists, Mr. Matthew Whale. Mr. Matthew Whale is Minister of Education and Human Resources Development of the Solomon Islands, Pacific Island. Mr. Whale had a long career as a business leader. He was also a member of the Solomon Island Christian Association, and he played a central role to bring back the peace in his country do, during the Civil War. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Judith Rodin, she's uh, president of the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation in New York uh, is to promote the well-being of humanity. It's one of the largest private foundations. Is that right? <laughs> After, I would like to present you Mrs. Barbara Stocking. She's chief executive of Oxfam. Oxfam is a very famous um, confederation of uh, organization. Oxfam was very present in Copenhagen during the summit. You, you were in Copenhagen too. You will speak about after. <laughs> Thank you very much. After, I, will, I want to present you Mr. Kuroda. He is president of the Asian Development Bank in Manila. He studies law at the University of Tokyo and he studies economy at the Oxford University. Und endlich Patrick Aufstetter. Patrick Aufstetter ist in Zürich geboren. Er hat Ma Maschineningenieurstudium absolviert in Zürich und er ist heute Patrick Aufstetter who now works at the WWF Switzerland. He is head of the Climate Policy Department and is also in charge for fiscal, climate fiscal reform. I think he was in Copenhagen at the conference accompanying Mr. Leuenberger. To ask, perhaps um, I will give the floor to you, Mr. Wall. Uh, what is the... Uh, what is the, the, the current situation of your country? Uh, I think you, you suffered already today from the climate change. Thank you. I suppose from the Pacific region, 
um, I need not say that we are at the receiving end uh, of much uh, of what is happening insofar as climate change is concerned. We are part of those on this globe who are least able to afford the adaptation that is required um, as a result. Um, and so we continue to join with others, Oxfam and, and others in the civil society sector, and certainly with, uh, uh, as part of the small island developing states, to advocate for uh, coming good on the commitments that have been made by Annex I countries um, and with concrete mechanisms that would fund uh, the commitments. And so we move beyond just the pledges. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, I would like you, you to describe really what are today the consequences. You had, you told me before, um, tsunami. It was two years ago. You had earthquake. It was very recently. Is that consequences of the climate change uh, or not? Perhaps um, the earthquakes uh, themselves may not be linked directly um, to climate change and global warming and, and so forth. Uh, but we have had recently, um, of course, in 2007, we had a, a major tsunami in the western part of the Solomon Islands. Um, and of course, recently, Tonga and Samoa in the Pacific, uh, and also in the Solomon Islands uh, in January. Um, and I flew to the affected areas, I was also supervising minister for internal affairs at the time. And um, we do, insofar as climate change is concerned, we do have a lot of coastal communities, my own community, um, my electorate, my constituency, um, exists on artificial islands built some thousands of years ago and has evolved uh, its own distinct culture um, and existence. Obviously, in a number of years, um, there will be serious need to, to adapt, to move. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the effects of climate change is upon us. Um, I'm no scientist, um, but it is upon us, I know, because most of the kitchens, I'm just telling you a, a real life practical situation, in, on these artificial islands are on the ground. Once a month, for two days, they are unable to use those kitchens because we will have the tides coming in, the high full moon tides. And so they are unable to use those kitchens. But increasingly, people say, we're, we're not going to move. There must be something done. Uh, so we, we continue to maintain our culture and our lifestyle. How tenable an argument that is, is another matter. But I think it does highlight um, the issues and the consequences of climate change. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And we will speak about, after uh, we, we frequently speak about uh, Tuvalu as a, a, a kind of symbol of the climate disaster. Uh, I would like to, to, to ask the same question to Mr. Kuroda from Philippine. Huh? Philippine is a... Mm -hmm. Is, uh, you have a lot of natural disaster, typhoon. I don't know if it's really the consequence of the climate change or your position of, on the map. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, um, of course, uh, recent uh, uh, typhoons uh, as well as, uh, as uh, tsunamis uh, affected uh, <coughs> the Philippines, uh, certainly. And uh, whether, for instance, uh, uh, very severe typhoons uh, last year uh, were the results of uh, climate change or not. Um, people still uh, uh, arguing, but uh, what is quite uh, clear is that the trend uh, of climate change, severe and severe typhoons coming and, uh, and uh, more and more serious uh, uh, flood uh, uh, occurred uh, in, in uh, not only in the Philippines but also in Indonesia, uh, <coughs> Thailand, Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, India, uh, so on and so forth. And this trend 
is certainly related to uh, uh, climate change. And I must say that in coming years and decades, if this trend is left as it is, it would uh, surely bring about more serious, uh, devastating natural disasters uh, year after year to Asia and the Pacific. Because two things uh, <coughs> affect seriously Asia and Pacific. One, um, more than 60% of the global population live in Asia. And uh, more than half of uh, uh, poor people live in Asia. And many of them uh, live uh, in coastal areas, river basin, uh, very much uh, 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 subject to uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, impact. Um, so, um, from Asia and the Pacific perspective, uh, climate change adaptation is really, really crucial mm -hmm. for those uh, 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 countries uh, which are disproportionately affected by the climate change, uh, mm -hmm. including, of course, uh, Pacific uh, island countries like, like, like Solomon Island. Okay, uh, let's continue. Mm. Uh, only now, the, the really to speak about the, 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 the current effect of the climate change. Mm. Uh, Mrs. Stocking, mm. you're not from Africa, <laughs> you're mm. from England, but you know Africa, you were <coughs> in Copenhagen. Um, Africa is perhaps today, I don't know if you agree with this uh, thing, Africa is perhaps the, the climate change victim number one. Is that true? Yeah. Probably. Uh, can you explain what, what are the already now the consequences? Yeah. Well, yes, as, as an organization that works on both emergency response and long-term development, we see climate change affecting poor people um, now. And, and I think th the debate that goes on that says climate change is coming is just not true. As we've heard, it's already happened to poor people. Now, you've already said that the trend is that extreme weather events are increasing. The statistics show that they, they have doubled since the 1990s. Now, you can't say that each one is to do with climate change, but that trend fits what was predicted in terms of extreme weather events. And, of course, we see that right across Africa, in particular with droughts um, and floods and often in, in subsequently in the same places. And, and one of the things that is often so sad in travelling in Africa is that the people don't understand what's been happening to them. Uh, about nearly two years ago, I was in northern Uganda, and they just had the floods. And one of a, a, an older farmer said to me, um, "We've never had floods here before. I don't understand what's happening. Is it because of the war? Because they were in the war zone that had been going on for 20 years? So people are trying to f understand and find out why it is that this is happening to them." But it isn't just the extreme events, it's, it's also the way the seasons are changing. And everybody we talk to in different countries, in Africa, but also in Afghanistan or Bolivia, the farmers all say the same thing to us. They say the seasons have changed and we don't know when to plant. We plant the seeds and then the rains come, huge rains that we've never known and wash all the seeds away or no rains come at all. So life is becoming much more unpredictable and uncertain for people. It's not that it's changing from one thing to another thing. It's changing from one thing to a whole variety of things that might happen to them. And I think that's the difficulty that they have in really you know, preparing themselves. And that's why we're doing so much work in those countries to try to see how people can adapt, to be more resilient, to have more different options um, you know, in these circumstances. And of course, that is going to require some very serious financing. But perhaps you know, we'll come yeah, on to that yeah, issue financing later. We'll speak after. We, 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 we stay now for a roundup about the, con the, actual, the current consequence. Uh, perhaps uh, you, Mrs. <laughs> Robin, uh, I, I give you uh, experts are thinking today that 2 billion people will be affected by water shortage if we don't take the right measures till the end of the century. Uh, it's, it's terrible. What, what, what can we do? Yes, we've talked about Africa and Asia. Think about it in a different way um, because the water challenges will only increase. 
um, the agricultural practices, the climate mitigation practices that are um, looking to some forms of biofuels um, in many countries are actually adding to our water challenge. So often we use one set of solutions and we make m greater vulnerability towards other sets of issues. Asia is about to experience a huge onslaught of urbanization, about six 60% of the increase in the urban population will occur in, ur in Asian cities that already, in many cases, have water shortages and vulnerabilities because they don't have the right infrastructure. So part of the solution is to consider adaptation and resilience building strategies, strategies that affect water management, resource management, where you're really building an integrated strategy. And often we do this in silos. So we have water people doing water and agriculture people doing agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. And adaptation is really, and resilience building is about the integration of all of these in a way that makes um, everyone more adapted, everyone more resilient, um, but particularly focuses on those who are poor and vulnerable for whom uh, water uh, is already a pressing everyday life problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hofstetter, we've spoken about the Philippines, Asia, Africa, but even in Switzerland, we see the consequences of climate change. Yes, indeed. Switzerland is also one of those countries that has been particularly hard hit in contrast to the countries we've heard about. Uh, Switzerland, of course, has above average good means to protect itself against this, but we know that three quarters of the glasses will have disappeared, will have melted. You can say that maybe that is a problem for tourists, but it's certainly not a question of survival. But there are also problems of permafrost melting, lots of parts of the mountain area will not be inhabitable anymore. And if things continue in this way, as be, is being forecast by the scientists, it will have a very negative effect on agriculture. The forecasts for the second half of this century are really dire and will be very difficult to bear. May I just add to what Judith has said? Why is WWF so very active in climate protection? Well, one has to understand that it's a question of biodiversity. Climate change also has an effect on biodiversity. Everything is interlinked, and WWF has realized that the 50 years of work that has been accomplished may very well be lost within a very short time because of climate change. So there's a development which is practically going to destroy all our good work, and one has to protect and preserve biodiversity. It's not just a question of buying a plot of land and putting up a fence around it and say that this is nature conservation. What you have to do is work hand in hand with the local population and make, under sh make sure that one does protect agricultural activity in the long term, preserve nature in the long term. All these things have to be balanced. See that uh, we have heard that uh, we can see today the consequence. Um, we had a, a summit in Copenhagen, a great opportunity to prevent a climate change. President Obama were, was in Copenhagen, the Chinese, the European, Sarkozy, the Lionberg, <laughs> everybody were in Copenhagen, but the international community didn't take really the right measure. Why? Why, Mrs. Stocking? <laughs> and what, what, are the, what is the price of the inactivity? Well, why? It, it, it just comes down to each country looking at what its own issues and its own needs are and its own economy. 
and not realising that actually very severe compromises are going to be, have to be made if we are going to solve the problem for the whole. Um, I, I think one part of it is, is simply that, uh, that we had two years of negotiations, but really, frankly, heads of state didn't get involved until right at the end. And then I think they were really quite taken aback at what the issues were and were trying to understand how it affected their own country. And of course, there are many different interests. And it's, I, I, I absolutely would not blame any individual country. It's that you can say that the European Union did not really come up and take the leadership position that we thought it was going to do. It just backed away. Um, basically, America said it wasn't going to do anything unless China did more. China said it didn't want to be part of a treaty. Everybody had their own reasons for why, you know, why this couldn't work. And, and of course, uh, this is, for the people of the world, absolutely unacceptable. And as a campaigning organisation, and uh, especially with people working with people in the South, I just think we have to get everybody back to the table and really, you know, starting to negotiate again. And I do think that point, just, and I'll stop then, to, about people from the South is very important. We held climate hearings last year in 36 countries in the South. And one and a half million people were able to give their views about climate change to their own governments or local level leaders. And I think it's really important that the people who are, who are suffering this the most get a chance to speak up and have their voice heard about what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Mr. Well, do you think that uh, the country, the leader of the rich country, for instance, negotiate only for their national interests? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, yes, yes, yes no. I, I think so. I mean, I, this is a, a, a very complicated um, issue because I think a lot of the Annex One countries, for example, consider a mix of their own political and economic interests. Unfortunately, this is a climate change is a is a major issue for all of us, and I think therefore the role of the private sector becomes very, very important because the mix of political and economic interests of each of these major countries, um, I suppose that would include the core countries at Copenhagen um, that were essential in either moving us towards um, a binding treaty or not. The private sector does have a, a very strong hand to play uh, in, in moving that dialogue and make moving it to commitments. Um, but also the role of the people is very important. I do not see that ordinary people in China uh, would have views different to ordinary people here in Switzerland, that would be different to ordinary people in the Pacific, uh, that would be different to views of ordinary people in, in Bangladesh. I think the people of the world understand this, the catastrophe that we're facing much better than our leaders do. And so we do need to rise up we do need to make our voice heard. We need to harness our voice together through civil society and perhaps through the internet and other means uh, to make sure that our leaders pay a much greater uh, commitment to the goals that ought to, to um, that, that we're all ought, ought to be committed to. Thanks. Yes, but Mr. Kurada, uh, the, the, um, the rich nations are responsible for the pollution, huh? we, we know that. And they don't really want to reduce emissions. Do you think that people of your country could they be very angry with us? <laughs> I, 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 I tend to think, for instance, the Copenhagen process, um, not complete failure, certainly, uh, the Copenhagen process failed to produce any meaningful legally binding uh, target uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction or any meaningful uh, 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 binding uh, <coughs> uh, sort of uh, uh, financial contribution agreement uh, uh, in uh, the discussion. However, if you look at the uh, Copenhagen uh, accord or some some uh, political sort of uh, 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 agreement, uh, you can see the direction toward which the international community could, uh, 
I don't say would, but could uh, move. So uh, on the one hand, let's hope that uh, political leaders uh, would try again uh, to uh, reach some meaningful agreement on climate change mitigation as well as adaptation. Now, my second point is that whatever mitigation efforts are agreed uh, at the international level, climate change would continue for some time, maybe 20 years or so. That means that adaptation efforts are absolutely necessary. Mitigation is, of course, absolutely necessary. Otherwise, uh, the climate change would uh, result in huge damage to the uh, world as a whole uh, in the long run. Uh, but uh, but uh, mitigation efforts must be made, uh, may, must be started right now with, with uh, global effort. Mm. Uh, because uh, we you do see the trend, and the trend for some time anyway continue, mm -hmm. irrespective of, of, of uh, mitigation efforts. So, uh, mitigation absolutely necessary, and I hope that uh, the meaningful, uh, legally binding agreement could be made um, soon. Uh, and we ask uh, our leaders to 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 to, to engage uh, again, but at the same time, mitigation efforts must be made, uh, really. And here, th there's some, some asymmetry. Uh, mitigation efforts, uh, cap and trade system, whether uh, it's com perfect or not, but still it generates, in some sense, automatically some financing for mitigation efforts. But for adaptation effort, mm -hmm. no such mechanism exists mm -hmm. unless the international community provide a uh, uh, large amount of resources for, uh, for, for particularly uh, mitigation effort in developing countries. Mm -hmm. so th I think uh, uh, the adaptation effort. So adaptation is really, uh, really yeah. crucial. We will turn back to this mm. question. Mm. Uh, but uh, you said mm -hmm. we have to add, Mrs. Mm. Uh, Rodin, in, in America and your country, <laughs> you have very powerful <laughs> lobbies who doesn't want to act. <laughs> I, 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 me, I won't represent have. the American government. <laughs> <Not sure>. <laughs> but, um, I, I think Copenhagen succeeded in the adaptation area more than we realized. There was dedication to adaptation mm. financing mm. and some degree of agreement. Mm. Um, and we shouldn't overlook that because mm. it's not enough, but it, it led to some area mm where n all the countries said we can make common cause. And the understanding of the impact on real people wasn't lost on the leaders when they decided that they mm. could focus fo mm. first on adaptation. I think we have to take that mm. a modest success, um, but it really was a success. Mm. Um, I think the United States, it's, it's really quite interesting what's happening because um, industry in the United States and local governance mayors, governors in our various states are far more advanced in their commitments to all of these issues than our national government has been. So in a way, what's getting played out in Washington right now is sort of catch up to what really is happening at the local level. When you see um, Western states joining in a huge number of mitigation strategies, uh, and many adaptation strategies. It's really quite wonderful. Same thing is happening with governors in the Northeast in terms of, of uh, energy mitigation measures. Um, the United States is not invulnerable with regard to adaptation and needing to build resilience, so there's increasing interest in that. Um, I do think that the, the delay in Washington is real. Um, I think that the challenges that President Obama has um, are clearly, and, and his administration has decided that health care and um, refinancial regulation is a higher priority. Um, I don't think, even if he walked on water, that he could have influenced the Copenhagen outcome more than he did, um, or, or even if we had had legislation that it would have influenced 
um, necessarily the outcome more significantly. But I do think that each step towards global agreements is an important one. Um, and that we can't wring our hands over Copenhagen's failure because then we'll be setting ourselves up for Cancun. So we need to say each step is an important one. We've made some important steps. We see what failed at Copenhagen and how we can remobilize in certain ways. Um, but uh, we need to celebrate the successes as well. Patrick Ostetter, Sie waren in the you were a member of the Swiss delegation in Copenhagen, Mr. Hofstetter. Could you perhaps tell us what position was taken by the Swiss delegation in Copenhagen? Could you give us our view? Do you think it was a failure or success? Well, I can tell you there was a, an enormous effort. You've asked me a whole series of questions, and I'll try and be as brief as possible. What did Switzerland bring along in its suitcase to Copenhagen? A lot of goodwill, a mandate from the federal government of Switzerland, which wasn't really very specific or very concrete. Not uh, There were some specific uh, aims for reduction in carbon emission of 20 to 30 percent. 40 percent would, of course, have been the kind of target in order to reduce the industrial emission of industrialized countries. So Switzerland's offer was really below what other countries were offering in Copenhagen. Regarding financing, and we'll come back to that later on, Switzerland didn't have anything in its backpack, no special proposal. In Copenhagen, certain countries did get together into a huddle and made some suggestions. and. Switzerland then got the green light from Bern after the Copenhagen to accept and participate in this kind of negotiation. But this is not the kind of position that is really very helpful on the international stage. It's an error to believe that countries were reticent at a national level and then traveled to Copenhagen and suddenly developed into being very enthusiastic about everything and, and accepting everything, especially when it comes to contributing to the financing of the climate change. It only works if everyone has done their homework before traveling to Copenhagen, has already hammered out a political consensus at home, and is willing not to let more time go by before decisions are actually taken. So Copenhagen is a bit of waste of time, loss of time. But I do agree with this evaluation that has been made by others that things haven't come to a standstill. We are not sitting there twiddling our thumbs and saying, oh, well, it was a failure. We have to now prepare ourselves for Mexico and work is ongoing. But one must realize that when we decided on this roadmap two years ago, that's to say that we shouldn't only talk about uh, preventing emissions, but also um, talk about trans transfer of technology and certain other adjustments, a lot has already been achieved. If you had started a questionnaire in Bali and everyone had written down on a piece of paper what was being achieved or what was going to be achieved, then I think uh, a, a lot would have been said about the willingness to accept emission control for example, in China or India, obviously the two countries are not yet willing to enter into a binding agreement. But this reduction of CO2 emission is a principle that has been accepted. And now, of course, we really have to fine tune this agreement or this principle. So the greatest success of Copenhagen is what we had already achieved before Copenhagen started. OK, let's now go on to the subject of financing. Who has to pay and how much? Which financing instruments are effective and will be effective? <laughs> right, well, I, I, I just want to say I, I agree with Judith that the, the one good thing that came out of Copenhagen was the commitment to financing, the $100 billion a year. Now, from the Oxfam point of view, we, we would say that wasn't enough because we estimated that probably what's needed is about $200 billion. And that is both for the adaptation that we've all been talking about, but also the mitigation because, um, you know, as, we, as we've said, um, 
the poorest countries have also got to have their own growth, but we want that to be low carbon growth, and that will need need financing. So, uh, but anyway, 100, 100 billion sort of saying that that is coming is is very good, but we're rather aware that governments often promise things that don't ultimately get delivered. And that's the issue now, is to make sure that they, their money is delivered. And to do that, we nearly need to have some mechanisms about how we're going to get that money. And, and, and the problem is, I, I don't think I don't... I think we slightly disagree, Mr Crow, that I think the, the money that, was, uh, that ought to come out of some form of carbon pricing mm -hmm. would have been for adaptation too. And the real problem is that without that deal, um, anything that would have been to do with carbon itself and carbon emissions, now, sort of, it's very difficult to make it part of working out where the finance should come from. So we're now in the situation of looking and saying, well, what sort of innovative financing mechanisms are there? In the UK and some other countries, we're talking about, could we use a financial transactions tax um, you know, on all those big banks and all the things that they're doing to, to bring some money in? That may not be the right one, but we certainly need some innovative mechanisms because we know that you know, our governments in rich countries are going into, are in great debt and they're not likely to just produce more public money from straight taxation. We wouldn't all put up with it as, as taxpayers. So we have to really think of some new mechanisms and we need that work done very urgently because nobody, this money is not going to come to the poorest people if we don't find those mechanisms. Mm -hmm. New mechanisms, but we who have to pay. America, <coughs> Africa, Europe, ASEAN, oh. China, everybody, or the no. rich country? No, it's got to be the rich countries who, who have, uh, caused, have, have produced the carbon emissions, who've had all their growth, as you know, a lot of their growth since the Industrial Revolution from those carbon emissions. They've caused the climate change, and it has to be the rich countries that pay for that. Poor countries just cannot be expected to do that. Mr. Way, do you think too? The rich country have to pay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yes, I do think that. <laughs> I think the proportion of responsibility ought to be reflected in terms of the financial commitments that must finance uh, mitigation and adaptation arising out of this. Mr. Kuroda? Yes, I, I, I totally agree. <coughs> According to uh, some World Bank estimate, uh, just for adaptation, uh, efforts, uh, the world requires at least uh, 100 billion dollars annually and uh, could uh, increase over time. And uh, according to our estimate at uh, Asian Development Bank, just for Asian Pacific countries, uh, adaptation uh, cost uh, would be something like 28 billion dollars annually. So roughly one third uh, of the global uh, uh, adaptation uh, cost uh, would incur in, in Asia and the Pacific. Now, these figures are huge. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think there must be some uh, funding mechanism uh, for uh, adaptation efforts, uh, simply because uh, most of uh, uh, difficulties exist in poorest countries, and they cannot finance uh, adaptation costs, huge costs to buy themselves. So the international community, uh, the donor community, must uh, finance uh, the adaptation efforts uh, to be uh, made in uh, developing countries, particularly uh, poorest countries like, as I said, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on and so forth. Now, <coughs> I, I, I think basically uh, the, 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 the some sort of uh, official development assistance or some sort of uh, uh, aid by the rich countries uh, is absolutely needed. And, uh, and uh, some uh, new uh, uh, tax, uh, that may be one one way to raise uh, necessary uh, money. There may be some other ways, but absolutely necessary is that uh, that uh, that the international community must provide mm -hmm. finance to, to to developing countries to adapt against the mid, uh, the, against the climate change. But we know that the rich country have huge public deficit. 
it's the case of America, Mrs. Robin. Oh. Uh, so let me stipulate that I absolutely agree that the rich countries have responsibility here and, and put that aside. That, that is critical and I think we all agree on that. But if we only rely on that, we are going to be in trouble in terms of financing. So some other, Barbara talked about let's look for innovation. We need to rely on, and we haven't had conversations at the global leadership level, about relying on private capital. There are literally billions of dollars around the world in double bottom line investment funds, funds that have to produce both a social and a financial return. We ought to be thinking very strategically and creatively about how to tap those investors, pension funds, um, wealth funds that, that must do this. And I think we've not spent enough time thinking about that. George Soros had a very interesting suggestion about special drawing rights at the IMF for climate investments, another really out of the box way of thinking at the moment. Um, and, the, and the one thing that I really want to stipulate around which there's very little conversation, the reason I think that the estimates vary so much mm -hmm. about what is necessary for adaptation funding is that depending on who's doing the estimating, mm -hmm. they're making different assumptions mm -hmm. about how effectively those funds are going to be used. Mm -hmm. And so what we really need, we've developed, um, uh, and others maybe as well, but Rockefeller, McKinsey, and Swiss Re um, recently came out with a report on the economics of climate ad adaptation where they give uh, metrics for countries and local areas to do real risk assessments, do plans that prioritize the strategies for investment um, because investments are going to be very different um, depending on the needs, pretty much local needs, create um, then a way to really build resilience and capacity um, and use those funds effectively, governments are going to have to, in the developing world as well, create the kind of policy environment that builds um, the use of those funds effectively, brings in private industry to do infrastructure. They don't want to come in where there aren't, isn't the right policy environment. So. In the discussion about financing, we need to add the discussion about what good implementation looks like in order to really understand how much money is ultimately going to be needed. And I think there's a lot of very creative work going on here that could actually drive down some of the, of the financing calculations by really thinking about implementation at the front end um, uh, in a more creative way. Uh, I, I want to open the discussion, but uh, feel like no to these of Maybe just uh, very briefly on this issue of financing, Mr. Hofstadter. Yes, certainly. I think it's important to understand that in Copenhagen, a very second important step was taken in regarding financing, and I'm sure that the U.S. has helped in making it very clear. China said and declared that it didn't want to make any financial contribution. It's not a question of who was going to pay, but who was going to receive. And if some emerging countries simply say, no, they don't want to make any statements, then it's, of course, it's quite easy to conclude that it's only the rich countries that would bear the load, the burden, and that it would be transferred to the developing countries. That's an important point to made, make. And last week, the emerging countries went even further. They said that they could even imagine maybe participating in the financing of some solutions. That's more than we ever expected. So we're making progress week by week in this field of financing. But to come back to what Barbara said, this is important for the Swiss here. We must understand that it's going to be very difficult to get the money to obtain some funds through tax income of the government. That would be 1.2 billion just for Switzerland a year. And that's about one cup of espresso per person a week. It's not more than that. It's not a lot of money. But it means 200 Swiss francs per capita per annum that would have to be collected and raised. And that's quite a lot of money would be very helpful if we could establish a mechanism 
which would not have to delve into the normal budget, the ordinary budget. There are all sorts of mechanisms, for example, a levy on international air travel and international maritime transport, and to kill two birds with one, with one sto stone to get such monies and also to prevent at the same time this very unreasonable shipping of goods just because it's one or two cents cheaper to have potatoes washed far away from where they're produced and grown is something one should do away with. It would be good to combine this or perhaps the emission rights that would be awarded by the UN once a year would not be given away but they would be put to auction and then the revenue from this auction could these auctions could be used to finance these transfers that is say the transfer of finance from from the richer to the poorer countries to, to open the discussion we have yet to get ignited so the floor is now on the floor If you have any questions, please raise your hand so that you can get the microphone. Uh, you have a lot of panelists up here who I'm sure will be able to answer all your questions. Right at the back of the hall. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stefan Kleinsorger. I'm from France and a director of finance in medium-sized companies. I have a question to Ms. Stocking and Ms. Rodin first, because um, what are Oxfam and Rockefeller Foundation doing actually to convince their governments and for Oxfam to convince the EU really to go ahead with climate change adaptation policies? And for Mr. Kuroda, what is the Asian Development Bank really doing to finance climate change projects in their area? Thank you. Thank you for these two questions. First to Ms. Robin. Uh, yes, Rockefeller has uh, three interrelated initiatives. One is working on the African continent to build, within building agricultural capacity, to build climate resilience capacity at the same time. So a number of investments in a number of countries throughout Africa. Uh, in Asia, our investments are building resilient cities. Um, Mr. Kuroda talked about the vulnerability of many of the cities on river deltas or coastlines, and so we have a, quite a significant investment. And in both of these, we're linking networks so that there's leverage and learning um, that can be taken to scale within the countries. The third part of our initiative is U.S. policy. Um, there are uh, federal laws in the United States preventing private foundations from direct lobbying or advocacy. So in this way, we, f um, uh, we don't lobby our government, but we fund um, many, many advocacy groups uh, in this area that are directly funding the uh, policy uh, work uh, and uh, doing extraordinarily good advocacy work uh, to the U.S. government uh, at the present time. Um, it is a very difficult piece of work. Mr. Kuroda, which project yes, are uh, you financing? Yeah, um, <coughs> we have a uh, few uh, sources of, uh, of, of uh, financing for uh, climate change adaptation. One of them is uh, called Asian Development <laughs> Fund, which uh, is replenished every four years by donor countries and could be used uh, for uh, various uh, 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 poverty reduction uh, projects or as well as uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation project in low-income countries. And also we have a few trust funds uh, contributed by some uh, donor countries for specific purpose of uh, climate change adaptation. And as I said before, um, the acute need exists in low-income countries, uh, and for them, uh, uh, concessional resources are absolutely necessary. Now, how to assist them? Uh, three ways. One is to help the, uh, those governments to 
uh, establish uh, adaptation strategy, kind of comprehensive strategy is needed uh, in order to prioritize various projects and programs uh, in uh, those countries. So help the government uh, uh, to establish, uh, develop uh, climate change adaptation strategy. Uh, coupled with, uh, with uh, the kind of vulnerability assessment, a particular uh, uh, sub-regions or areas are quite vulnerable. So uh, uh, vulnerability assessment, which is uh, quite uh, time consuming and, 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 and requires a uh, lot of uh, technical assistance, uh, again, ADB provide on ground basis. And thirdly, of course, we have been for some time trying to uh, make our uh, infrastructure investment and other uh, uh, investment projects as much uh, climate proof as possible. But that is, in some cases, very costly. <laughs> that is a problem. So uh, I really hope that, uh, that uh, the Copenhagen uh, spirit uh, prevails and uh, the international community, donor community, provide the uh, concessional resources, uh, not only to ADB itself, but also some other uh, international agencies to uh, strengthen uh, assistance effort uh, to uh, uh, low-income countries uh, for uh, adaptation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Miss uh, three, three quick ones then on what we do to lobby the British government. First of all, we, we go and see them directly. And the week before Copenhagen, I can say that I saw the Prime Minister three times in that week on this subject. On the other hand, they're used to seeing Oxfam and World Wildlife Fund and being lobbied by them. So the real, the second thing is to really try and demonstrate that the whole public, a wider public, is really concerned about this. And that's why we did so much campaigning before Copenhagen in the UK too, with the big march uh, in London and in other cities around the UK. Um, the London one brought out 50,000 people, the wave. It was a fantastic experience of real positiveness about saying go to Copenhagen for us, this is what we want to do. But the third bit is, I'm also glad you're from the private sector because we work very closely in groups with the private sector to go together to the government um, because I think it's very powerful when NGOs and private sector are sending the same messages and basically progressive um, private sector companies I think have been very good in wanting more or less the same things that we're saying that we want for the people concerned. Yeah, any other frage? Another question here? Please wait for the microphone. Oh, entschuldigung, <laughs> nachher, entschuldigung. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Susanne Mitzanta. I'm an entrepreneur in Switzerland. Um, my question is, or I, I'd like to uh, I'd like your approach to taking this to the individual level because I think that's very important, not talking about nations all the time. And I was flying in at Al Zurich Airport um, these last two days and there were huge delays because of private jets flying people in and out of the <laughs> Davos Forum. <laughs> One jet per person. I'm exaggerating, but I think there is a point here. And I find that, or it's a guess that the ecological footprint of many of those leaders we are asking questions to um, is rather bad. And um, I would like to have your answers. Sie können, <laughs> Sie können vielleicht diese Frage Perhaps this is a question for Mr. Hofstetter. You know maybe that our minister in fact traveled to Copenhagen by train from Switzerland. Yes, that's right. However, he did fly back to Switzerland on a private jet. Well, you, not everything is possible. There are two important points to make. First of all, the total emissions that are part of the climate change negotiations are really uh, negligible considering the entire challenge that is 
something we have to pick up um, um, regarding climate change. But these are questions that are put regularly by the media. But the second point is the really decisive one, and that is the image that this portrays. As long as the good life and standard of living is connected with a high carbon footprint, we will have a problem. Mr. Ramesh, the Indian Minister of uh, the Environment, said that he didn't come to Copenhagen with an environment agenda, but an economic agenda. He feels that he has to consume an awful lot of fossil energy for India to reach the same standard of living and well-being as Switzerland. So this is a mental attitude that has to be changed. McKinsey and Co. have proved again and again that there is no need for high carbon emission for a high level of prosperity and well-being. We believe that this is so, so we have to change this perception so that the countries can reduce their carbon footprint. But Mr. Hofstetter, uh, conundrum, why can India not make the same concessions? Why is it the Swiss, for example, who have to make all the concessions? Why are we asking India to make all the efforts? Yes, that's what I was asking. It's a great example. India. I don't know whether you know the Bollywood films. Usually Bollywood films have at least one scene that has been uh, filmed in Switzerland, and everyone knows what happens in Switzerland, what the conditions are, and how much we rely on fossil energy. So we could really prove the opposite. We could become carbon, carbon neutral despite having a high uh, standard of living. And once we've been able to prove this, not only in Switzerland, but if other countries or groups of countries or regions can prove this quite clearly, then the other countries, especially the big emerging countries, can adapt their development mode radically. There are really great differences between the mid-level, the BRIC countries. And so if you look at what Brazil did starting to invest years ago in sugar to, to create biofuels, there's a lot of creativity going on um, in developing countries thinking how to have low carbon footprints. China's doing really incredibly creative thinking about wind sources and solar sources. So um, there is a sense in many of these countries that they need to find their own solutions, and many of them invested earlier, I think, and more creatively than some of the developed world countries. So we need to get a little bit out of the mindset um, that the, the fairness principle means that the developing countries should now necessarily have to be high carbon emitters. I, I was going to say it two things. Sucking, yeah. Sorry. One thing is, first of all, one of Oxfam's campaigners walked to Copenhagen from Oxford. Um, he did have to take a ferry at one point. But anyway, but it did make me think um, about the question about maybe, maybe if all those world leaders had to walk to Davos, it might give them a different feeling about things. Um, anyway, that was my first thought. Just another point, though. I think this airline travel is quite an interesting one because it's the one that we know that we can't change the fuels in very easily at the moment. There's, there's no easy way out of this. And yet, just leaving aside leaders, for so many people, a, an airline is, absolute, is actually about about freedom you know it's about seeing the world it's it's you know it, it you know it's something that you know everybody values a lot so I think in, in the public mind actually uh, um, airline travel always e almost epitomizes the problem of climate change and what we're going to do about it because in so many other areas we can either have more energy efficiency or we can have renewables or different ways of doing it but um, the climate the, the airline one is a difficult one though thank goodness as it's been said it's only a small percentage of the whole so perhaps if we just cut down on each by half or something, that'll, that'll help. Another question, yeah? Man soll sich ja zuerst I feel that I'm part of creation. I have a lung and I breathe. I'm that kind of being, and I don't believe that you can survive as an individual without preserving the ecosystem. 
especially the big uh, tropical rainforests. I have put up a sign outside the school. And I've shown, I'm showing some photographs of the last rainforests and jungles of the world. Before I left Tübingen, I asked Greenpeace in Hamburg to send me a beautiful T-shirt made of natural cotton. And one can read on this T-shirt, if the world were a bank, it would have been saved a long time ago. But the world is not, or the planet is not a bank. Unfortunately, I'd like to turn to this issue of finance. It's an error to believe that, or oh, there are some, there have been proposals for years about how to help the developing countries to preserve these last rainforests. And I would like to suggest that you write down the following, www.globalmarshallplan.org. Global Marshall Plan is in one word. And there you can see the co-financing instruments that were already discussed within the context of the Millennium Compact. Mr. Chirac and Mr. Blair in 2005 agreed to the Tobin tax at 0.001 tax on currency transfers, monetary transfers, and transactions. This would be quite easy to raise at least 100 million a year. On the other hand, about 12 times as much is being spent every year on military financing, but there's simply no willingness to do this, politically speaking, nor the bankers want to do anything. One could perhaps ask Joe Ackerman to make a, uh, available a certain amount for micro lending for the poor. That would prove whether all these people are willing to do something or just paying lip service to all this. So I've, I've also, I'm also showing something outside. There are more than 50 Nobel Prize winners who met in October last year and again in London in the spring. These Nobel Prize winners are giving their support to the program of the Protestant churches, that is to say that a certain amount can be made available for all sorts of development work, and that would be quite easy. So Greenpeace, the Protestant churches, and other NGOs are all working together. And one last sentence. I've got a text here in English from Greenpeace Zurich which is the text drafted and signed by the Nobel Prize winners I've just mentioned. And since ni November 1989, all children have the right to life, and this is a right which is being trampled on on a daily basis. Thank you. Would you like to talk about the Tobin tax in the, envi in environmental, in the environmental context, Mr. Kuroda? <laughs> This is, uh, this is not uh, a statement by a uh, <laughs> representative of the Asian Development Bank, uh, but uh, I happen to uh, worked, uh, have, have worked uh, for the Japanese Ministry of Finance for many years, uh, in particular in the field of tax policy and tax administration. And I have been always fascinated uh, by this idea of the Tobin tax. As you may know, uh, <coughs> uh, the late uh, Tobin uh, proposed uh, to impose very low rate of tax on foreign exchange transactions. The rationale uh, was to uh, make fluctuation of, of, of exchange rate uh, much smoother because uh, uh, as you may know, um, exchange transactions uh, uh, take place uh, over almost uh, every minute, and 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 and, uh, and if you, according to Professor Tobin, if you put some sand on on machine, the machine would move only slowly. Uh, so by imposing very low, almost thin 
rate of uh, tax on foreign exchange transaction, you can avoid the large fluctuation of exchange rate, uh, rather smooth, uh, slow movement of, uh, of exchange rate. Now, the idea of the Tobin tax uh, uh, has been uh, floating for maybe 30 years or so. It has never been uh, 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 implemented because exchange transactions can be easily moved to ev anywhere if, you, if uh, the, that kind of tax is imposed in, in, in London, then exchange transaction could take place in Hong Kong or New York, anywhere. Uh, however, <coughs> the concept of the Tobin tax is now expanded. Uh, the, the, uh, the tax on, for instance, stock exchange, tax on uh, other financial transactions are also called Tobin tax. Uh, from purely theoretical point of view, Tobin tax is only on uh, foreign exchange transactions, not on other financial transactions. But now the concept is widened. Then, uh, as you may know, in, even in London, there's tax on, on uh, uh, stock uh, uh, purchase or, 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 or selling. Uh, through uh, stamp duty and other, other kind of things. And uh, by the way, Japan used to have such kind of uh, uh, transactions tax. Uh, and so uh, there's a very wide range of issues to be discussed uh, as a matter of tax policy. But at the same time, of course, uh, what is the best way of financing climate change mitigation adaptation? Uh, that is, uh, again, uh, another very important issue. So, mm -hmm. I, as I said, I'm always, always fascinated by the, this idea uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in some form can be implemented, but uh, in the original form uh, propounded by Professor Tobin, it has never been uh, implemented. It's very uh, you agree? Yeah, I think... Yeah, no, the, when I talked at the beginning about a financial transactions tax, it was that wider point, not the Tobin, just on the exchange, currency exchange. Um, at the uh, a campaign that we're, we're engaging in, with actually with all the environment movement and uh, certainly in the UK, some of the domestic um, agencies, NGOs, is um, going to be called the Robin Hood tax. Do you know about Robin Hood? You know, he, he, he robbed the rich to give to the poor. Um, and it will be the launch, this will, the launch of this will be on February the 10th. So if you want to join in on that, I'm sure there are ways through the different agencies, including <laughs> WWF and so on, that can do that. However, I've just been meeting somebody pretty senior at the IMF who said, actually, why don't you not go for the financial transactions tax, but go for something even wider about a financial sector tax? Because he thought we'd get more agreement across the world that we could maybe bring it off. Because, you know, to make this work, you've probably got to have not necessarily everybody signed up to it, but you've got to have a pretty good, good global, you know, sort of impact to, to make it happen. So February the 10th is the day with the Robin Hood tax. <laughs> Robin Hood, to give, to, to, to rob to the rich, to give to the nature. At the <laughs> okay, another question? Yeah? Uh, yeah, another. The microphone. Well, uh, my name is Daniel Bischoff. I'm a student. And well, one issue I was missing in all this discussion is, well, I'm a pretty pessimist in my generation or for my generation. And I would say... Well, if we see the countries like the Maldives or the coastal countries that Mr. Whale talked about, I think we won't stop the climate effect on these countries and our generation. And so the whole problematic with the refugees that is coming. And so back, well, in the future is not only uh, f uh, this uh, problematic of the climate change, but it, that will be a financial and also a political issues with the refugees and everything. And so... If Copenhagen didn't work today, as well, well, the students or just our young generation, we would have expected that Copenhagen would work. How will even a bigger summit in the future, where it's not only the climate uh, change, but also all this refugee problematic, and it will be an even bigger summit, and well, how we're going to face it? What's, uh, well, what's your opinion on that? 
<laughs> good question. We want. <laughs> Maybe. Who wants to give uh, <laughs> a message to the young gener generation, <laughs> Mr. Afshita? <coughs> well, well, I guess I'm, I am the youngest, so, so that's probably yeah, why, yeah. Why, why you ask uh, me. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's very risky, actually. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, uh, you're absolutely uh, clear in what you're saying. I mean, even if we stop emissions now to zero, uh, climate change is going on and, and will alter the landscape and, and, and many of the low-lying islands will, will lose their, 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 their country. And uh, we already know some, like Tuvalu already asks for, for, for asyl uh, to, to, to leave their country. And that's the, the kind of more peaceful way. And then we have uh, the other situation where some say that uh, what we can observe in Morocco and Spain today is the first sign of migration due to climate change in, change in uh, Africa. So this is going to be absolutely the... the the future hot topic and is also the reason why uh, other ministers started to be involved <laughs> in climate change as well. And as you already mentioned, the more people and the more topics you involve, the messier it gets to actually get a common opinion on, on, on how to proceed. Um, so there is, from my side, no, no easy uh, answer to that. So my, my major hope, and, and I'm a positive uh, person in, in the sense that I believe uh, very much that, that uh, we will somehow manage to, to, to get this, this curve. So, so um, since it, as, as a big difference to the uh, world trade negotiations, where you can say, okay, we didn't really achieve much in the last three years, so maybe we wait another three years and, and then the time will be ripe to make a next step. That's okay, that's no problem, we have time, we can wait. I mean, there are a few people that suffer from that, but it's not really a, a global problem. But climate change is going to, to hit week by week. It, we are going to see the signs again and again and again. So my best guess is that the political will will increase a lot in the coming months, years, decades, and will help finally to overcome this obstacle that, that it's getting more and more difficult to find a solution that suits to everybody. Yeah, can sure. I, yeah, can I, just, uh, can I just add to that, that your pessimism must lead you to action mm -hmm. and uh, must energize you to participate in the global uh, organic movement by civil society and ordinary people mm -hmm. to make sure that it converts, the, the pessimism converts to tangible commitment at the country level. Thanks. Very good answer. <laughs> uh, yes? Um, my name doesn't work. My name is Tina Kopp from Germany, and I have just uh, answered to your um, to our civic uh, or civilization. Uh, we cannot act if we don't know, and a lot of people don't know what they are doing. <laughs> so um, I was in Malaysia last year, and I saw the palm oil uh, trees all there, and um, they were sold to Europe as. Um, biofuel so we are buying biofuel and um, rainforest in Malaysia was chopped down and nobody knows it so <laughs> that's some some of the problems too so, yes the very good question what what to do to 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 well, inform yeah. to <laughs> But the world is changing. I mean, the digital world, and, 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 and if we're going on about age again, there's loads of you in here younger than us here, and you know much better how social networking works. And, you know, this, uh, the climate change, I think, will be the thing that is ultimately cracked, probably, by social networking, by people telling each other about things all the time, like you telling your friends about the, you know, the Malaysia, you know, and what's happening there. Um, because, you know, it, it's fantastic, the speed that this, this information is going round. And, you know... At, I think the key, though, is to get all that stuff that's going around, that information, to, to add together into the pressure on governments. That's the difficulty. We know that there's enormous, you know, discussion, you know, people twittering all the time and all the rest of it about these things, but it's not adding up back to press the government, and that's, that's what we need to get to happen. Barbara, the, the most accepted, as we've done analyses of the websites and social networking and 
the most effective ones are those that not only tell you what the problem is, but tell you what you individually can do. So those of you who are interested in starting them or participating in them, where people really see what I as a person can do about this, whether it's giving money or participating in some movement or changing my own behavior, those are the ones that really start to have a, a galvanizing and, and leveraging effect that really yeah. brings action and real consequences. So think about how you do that as well. Yeah. Okay, and there's a question. Yeah. Countries, poor countries in Africa, poor people in Africa and Asia, they need development. So there's a need for social development, there's a need for industrial development, and there's a need to check climate change. How can we strike a balance between the three? You want to answer? Yeah, Mr. Kuroda. Uh, this is a uh, very um, <coughs> uh, serious uh, question. Uh, actually, all uh, developing countries uh, are faced with this uh, kind of dilemma. Um, not only African countries, but also uh, Asian countries as well. Uh, of course, uh, we can be optimistic uh, in the long run. In the long run, uh, the uh, uh, effort uh, to mitigate climate change, uh, uh, kind of green growth, uh, could be uh, uh, compatible and, uh, and uh, consistent with uh, uh, economic development and, and, uh, and poverty reduction. Uh, we must uh, make uh, uh, utmost effort uh, to make uh, these two uh, uh, consistent uh, with each other. But certainly in, in the short run, in some uh, country, uh, these uh, could be really acute uh, dilemma. The one uh, Theoretically simple, but uh, that uh, practically not so simple way of uh, relieving this kind of dilemma is, of course, external assistance. Um, every year, uh, more than uh, uh, <coughs> uh, 50 billion dollar uh, uh, concession resources are uh, provided to developing countries, uh, including in mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, to assist uh, those countries to reduce poverty, while, of course, in many ways to uh, 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 improve energy efficiency and, uh, and, uh, and provide as clean energy as possible. But really, this is a huge challenge, and uh, it's not easy to uh, resolve. But I am quite sure that in the long run, they are they are compatible and consistent. And also, if you think about long-term implications of biodiversity impact, uh, environmental degradation, mm -hmm. uh, water pollution, soil uh, uh, pollution, air pollution, all of them uh, would inevitably affect the real living standard uh, of uh, the people including those in uh, poorest countries. So I Thank think, I think it's, it's, it's possible to, 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 to make them uh, compatible. We have some, uh, some minutes more to, to have question. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, I'm a student from the University of Zurich and I have two questions. The first question is, when I look around in Zurich or here in Switzerland, I see I don't see a lot of people who are willing to to reduce their standard of living to do something for the environment. And I ask you, how can a government or how can someone who knows that it's really, uh, I mean, she was right, a lot of people don't know anything about it, but how can we make people know about it, make people be ready to change their lives and maybe a bit a provocative question for a Swiss person, but um, 
is it uh, a democracy maybe dangerous for environmental <laughs> politics? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for these two questions. <laughs> Herr Hofstetter, wollen Sie eine Diktatur? Mr. Hofstetter, do you want a green dictatorship in Switzerland? Is that what we should aim for? Well, primarily I am a, a based in Bern and I do ask myself these questions. But when I look at the other models in other countries and how sustainable such programs are or not because there's a governmental change that doesn't seem to be a, an ideal model anyway. In any case, Switzerland is always very slow. Switzerland's mills grind very slowly. In countries where you have a rapid governmental change, of course, it's more difficult to follow the same model. How to change the environmental awareness of people? And you are saying that in Switzerland is not very sharp. And this is something that I cannot really confirm because we have more than 200,000 members of, world, of the World Wildlife Fund in Switzerland. But it is true that very few people are willing to, to give up anything when it comes to their standard of living. So we have to find a solution which combines environmentally and climate friendly measures whilst offering maybe even better quality of life and standard of living in the future. And I think that I'm, there are, I can be confident about some of the measures that aim at climate change. Most people understand how terrible climate change is and the terrible effects that it has. And maybe people are a little fed up with hearing about it all the time. They are wanting to move on to what can be done specifically, concretely. In fact, in Switzerland, quite a lot of homeowners are now thinking about what to change in their own homes replacing their central heating not by another fuel burning heating, central heating, but by some other uh, type of central heating. And this, I think, is a positive development. Uh, no, no, this is Robin. So, so we're only talking about what individuals can do. And the heating example is a great one, because we should get yes, companies please. that really create heating systems that go off and on at certain times or smart grids and sensitive to certain temperatures. So part of it is changing individual behavior, but some of it is changing the system that promotes our kinds of behavior. And I think um, we, we keep framing this in terms of what people have to give up or what governments have to give up. That's a really bad sell um, in terms of getting huge consensus. Um, and a kind of groundswell of opportunity. So the Africa question is the same answer in a way. Start with those investments where it's a win-win. The African governments want to invest in, Afri in agricultural development. They believe in food security. There are climate-friendly ways to invest in agriculture. There are climate-unfriendly ways. Create the advocacy and the demonstrations for the climate-friendly ways as long as the, as the um, investments are going to be made. There are huge investments that are going to be made in energy and all kinds of things. And, and to a young person, I would say, take the things that people want to do. Um, young women are concerned about their appearance and whatever, instead of dieting, walk. And so there are kind of win-win strategies that are more climate friendly um, and those that are not. And, and tell people what they can do, not what they can't. Now, any last question? One last or two more questions? No, lots more questions before we close. Um, another person from Oxford, <laughs> anyway. Uh, my name is Dr. Rainbird. I actually did PhD in environmental epidemiology. But um, there were a couple of things, because uh, I'm quite sure there's so many different mechanisms that may exist through private uh, initiatives for raising funds or through taxes, that if um, there is a mechanism to 
actually make it quite clear, like the flow chart almost, to um, the to the people of all the developed world countries, how um, the money actually works, who is collecting, who is gathering the funds, where is it going, what is the controlling um, sort of uh, steps in between in order to ensure the, and what are the priorities for the project. Everybody would go along much easier with everything that is being proposed because we are all supposed to sacrifice something. Um, so we, whoever wants, and another issue is that um, in the most developed countries we, we had to be happy with having flexible workforce which included much more traveling including air travel, so that's uh, another issue maybe to address. But um, there is also one um, question for Mr. Whale. I hope uh, that maybe uh, you were involved from very early on into environmental issues and uh, participating in the conference at U uh, University of East Anglia, by any chance? No? no? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. But uh, thank you for, for your answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a question for Mr. Wei. <laughs> you want to go? <laughs> yes, I think um, b before I forget, I want to come back to the one of the earlier questions here. I think there is a role in terms of the private sector, in terms of corporate ethics, in investments in Africa, in Asia, Pacific, um, and and in that um, also the private sector could provide leadership. Um, even if governments are dragging their feet. Um, and I'd, I'd like to add that perhaps seeing that the Council of Churches is in, involved in organizing, the, that there is a role for faith-based organizations uh, because there are moral issues involved uh, in this debate. Um, and perhaps not to jump too far from democracy, that the climate change or climate politics is uh, not better handled by democracy. That, that probably is a too radical a statement. Um, I know that in Switzerland, for instance, um, that uh, your laws permit you to have referendums on issues that are burning, and this is a burning issue. And I'm sure that there are ways you could frame questions that could be put um, to a referendum, and that way the citizenry could drag their reluctant leaders at the end um, on matters of public policy. <laughs> so, so those are perhaps some, some cons considerations that could be made. Gee, now I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't get to East Anglia. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Hofstadt, I also want to add something. Yes, I'd like to corroborate that and perhaps also inform you that such an initiative has already been taken and more than 150,000 sig signatures have been collected that's the number that is needed to submit this petition. And this is probably going to be submitted to the Swiss people, that is a, an initiative in favor of a healthy climate. That is more or less the title of this initiative. And of course, I'm sure it will be accepted, says the moderator. Very well, we have one last question. Yeah. Woman, with her, with her hand. Uh, okay, I don't see. I don't yeah. see. Ah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Um, my name is Yu Tingchen, starting at ETH uh, Zurich. Shh, please. Um, and now I have um, some question to um, Mrs. Stocking. Um, as I was surprised that um, some rich countries they are blaming the developing countries that they don't contribute to this topic, but actually, uh, if you compare the CO2 emission per capita, oh, yeah. you can see the rich countries there far more than, than, the, than the developing countries, and the cause of this climate change is because the developing um, in the industry de de developing in rich countries. So they should take the responsibility anyway. Um, but. I think there are many rich countries, they are inactive, like they didn't even do any homework before they went to um, Co Copenhagen. And also, um, like President Obama, he didn't want to invest so much in this um, 
um, climate adaptation, even though there are many activities from inside the country, they're proposing to do more to it. But I think, especially this time, when he's facing the cri um, financial crisis and some, from some political point of view, he doesn't want to lose the economic center uh, position or any other things. Now, um, because of that, he doesn't want to do more to do it. But actually, the ri rich countries they are dominating the global um, financial situation, um, the financial market, and they are dominating the, the whole world. And they have louder voices. Is there any other mechanism? <laughs> Is there any other mechanism that could force this? Uh, politi politicians in these rich countries to do more to do it to contribute to to this climate adaptation instead Thank of you. just uh, like we persuade them to do this but it's obviously not so practical now <laughs> when we see the failure in Copenhagen okay a question for yeah. Mrs. Talking do you want I to, to <laughs> It's, it's not, I mean, clearly it's not easy at all. And, and it, it, the only way I think you can go at this is the... Please, please, please. Please, we want to, to hear Miss Selking, please. Yeah. Is, is the two routes. I mean, one is the people of the country themselves really actually standing up to their own government and saying, you, you know, we want you to move, we want you to do this differently. The second thing, of course, is to get more pressure from the South, from the people who are experiencing this, and the South meaning the governments of those countries as well as the people concerned, and try and get the pressure coming both ways. Um, the other thing, thinking about an earlier comment, is... You know, after Copenhagen, you do just wonder if there's going to have to be some bigger global climate shocks before people realise, you know, what is really going on. In the end, we are going to do something about climate change. You know, it's not a matter about whether or not, it's how soon and how much suffering is going to take place before we get there. So our efforts have got to be to make it clear, you know, what the suffering is. Um, and a few more desperately cold winters in the north might help persuade more people that climate change is happening, or some very hot summers too. So a few more climate events in the north might be useful. <laughs> I'd like to now come up with a brief summary or summing up. You've said that it's not too late to adopt a, an appropriate climate policy. Such a policy has to defend the interests of those most affected, that's to say the poorest countries. Our countries, the rich countries, have a special role to play, a special part to play, especially on the financial side. Is that what you were saying? Uh, in very, very much of a nutshell. Thank you for your participation, for your contributions. Thank you for having taken part at the debate. And...